The Denver Broncos drop an absolutely gut-wrenching game in overtime to the Las Vegas Raiders. The Broncos, they made a change at play color prior to this game. What did the offense look like in bits and pieces under Clint Kubiak? What happened with the Broncos defense? And Broncos country shared their reaction to the overtime loss. You get that and much more on today's brand new episode, Locked on Broncos. You are locked on Broncos. Your daily Denver Broncos podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Broncos country? Welcome into a brand new episode, Locked On Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. The Broncos drop a disappointing loss at home in gut-wrenching fashion in overtime. We'll break down all the action on today's episode of the show. Just want to say thank you so much to everybody in Broncos country for tuning in and making Lockdown Broncos your first listen of the day every single day. Free and available everywhere you get your podcast in audio format or whether you're watching us on YouTube. Thank you so much. Just a favor, hit that subscribe or that follow button down below so you never miss out on a day's worth of Denver Broncos news, content, coverage, and more every single day all year long. We have you covered whether they win, lose, tie, or lose in overtime. It is just... Despair here once again from the South Stands to the end zone. I'm your host as always, Cody Rourke, Broncos reporter from Mile High Sports. Joined alongside as always by my co-host Sarah Bendrissi, expert, predominantlyorange.com. Sarah, I mean, what more do we need to say? Same old Broncos. And this time, you know, a home loss once again, losing six consecutive games to the Las Vegas Raiders. It doesn't feel good for everybody in Broncos country. This was a very, very disappointing and gut-wrenching loss. It was, Cody. I mean, my goodness. It's just one week after another. The Broncos have been in one-score games every single week of the season. This game was no different. Obviously, they hit that magic twilight zone number of 16 points offensively after a 10 to nothing start again. I mean, it's just getting to the point now where it's torturous. It's it's beyond disappointing. It's it's like when your parents are like, "I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed." It's gotten to the point where now the parents are mad. It's like get oh, get back over here. <laughs> uh, you need a. You, you, I don't even know, Cody. I, I'm at a loss for words. I just kind of find myself, you know, turning to other vices at the end of games. Like, what? How many cups of coffee can I drink throughout the game, or how many Coke Zeros do I need to inhale? After a Broncos loss, like all my favorite stuff, it's like I can't get it fast enough after a Broncos game because it's like what can replace what's supposed to be filling this void in my life where the Broncos used to be winning games. They used to be bringing me joy. They they used to be something that I looked forward to, like raising my kids around, watching Broncos games and like wanting my son and my daughters to really enjoy watching football it's to the point now that it's like my kids, nobody, nobody in our house enjoys watching the Broncos. It's tough, man. It's really tough. So, man, I feel for everybody out there in Broncos country right now who's probably reeling after this loss. Yet another embarrassing loss, really. And, and I mean, frankly, a, a game the Broncos should have won once again. So, but what should they really be winning right now, Cody? That's the question. I mean, can we really say the Broncos should be winning anything? I mean, they just stink on offense. They stunk today on defense. It was just bad all around. Yeah, it was not. I mean, everything that, that could go wrong in this game went wrong. And obviously, we'll talk about just, you know, the momentum plays, momentum shifting plays, and that sort. But the Broncos, before the game, they made a big-time change. Nathaniel Hackett handed over play-calling responsibilities to Clint Kubiak, who called the game there. There's some things we'll take away from that, obviously, on today's post-game report here. Lockdown Broncos, Denver drops to 3-7 and seven on the year after a disappointing home loss to the Las Vegas Raiders here. The offense... I, I feel like with Clint Kubiak, they were a little bit on a roll in that first half, Sarah. And one thing that was working, the quick passing game. That's something you and I have been touching on so far throughout the season. If Denver went with a quick passing approach, they might be able to move the ball downfield. And they did. Rhythm throws. We're talking about sit routes. We're talking about out routes. We're talking about some quick comebacks. And Russ using his legs to get outside the pocket to find guys open. We saw that in the first half. But then we talk about momentum shifting plays, right? The Broncos have a really nice drive right before halftime, and they get to the three-yard line. Melvin Gordon fumbles the ball, and luckily Quinn Miners bounced on it, but it backed the Broncos up, and it was a fourth down situation at that point. They go to bring out Brandon McManus to kick the field goal, which would have given the Broncos you know, a little bit of an advantage heading into halftime. The field goal attempt is blocked. So not only does Max Crosby force a fumble on Melvin Gordon, he blocks the next field goal attempt that Denver has, and all of a sudden – we were sitting there at halftime. I was talking with Andrew Mason, our good friend. I was like, 
This feels a lot like the Tennessee game, just the momentum, right? The momentum shifting out there. And certainly that was exactly what happened because Denver couldn't really do anything in the third quarter or the fourth quarter. They had a chance where they moved the ball in a couple of plays, but then they had something that set them back, a sack, a penalty. Once again, just the same old Broncos. Yeah, and they led pretty much the entire game, Cody. The Raiders did not lead this game until they scored that touchdown in overtime. So it's not like the Broncos were in bad position all throughout the game, but you're 100% right. Instead of going up 17-7 to there before halftime, that Melvin Gordon fumble kind of propelled a domino effect of bad things. And you hate to really pinpoint a loss on just one play, but that was when everything started to go bad for the Denver Broncos offense. Just think about... Think about for a second how different things would have been or could have been at least if the Broncos had gone up 17-7 to there. Then you get the ball coming out of the half. You've got a 10-point lead. It changes everything about how you know Clint Kubiak would continue calling the game. It changes everything about how comfortable Russell Wilson is, how your offensive line is able to play. It changes everything being up 10 points. So it, it to me, it's just like, you know, if it's not one thing, it's another for this Denver Broncos offense. But we could do an entire podcast, I feel like, on just kind of the situation with Melvin Gordon at this point, maybe being a really huge indictment on Nathaniel Hackett. I mean, I know he's kind of down bodies all over the offensive side of the ball, but you got to find different personnel at this point. I mean, Melvin Gordon has cost you drastically at, at worst, the worst possible times on a number of occasions dating back to last season. I mean, it, it's just crazy, Cody. I, I Again, we're we're sitting here watching all this happen and we're kind of just feeling the the raw emotion of it as the the rest of the fan base is but it's it, it just erased a very positive start it felt like a really good start to the game and Clint Kubiak was doing a good job like you said calling the quick passing game the Broncos were able to sustain some drives I, I don't think they even punted in the first half and it wasn't like they were just out there converting one third down after another they weren't even getting into third down situations so the offense was markedly better in the first half compared to what we've seen the rest of the season unfortunately you have that momentum killing play the fumble by Melvin Gordon and then you can't really rebound from it in the second half. And you have, you know, like the drop from Cortland Sutton and different things like this. It was just one thing after another for this Broncos team. The Kendall Hinton, the, the play where Russ drew him off sides and Kendall Hinton was wide open downfield. Couldn't reel in that. It would have been touchdown play. So, I mean, man, it, it's just when it rains, it pours for the Denver Broncos. And they can't seem to get back out of ruts that they dig themselves into. And that is the theme all year long. And nothing that you and I expected, nothing that Broncos country expected as well. And the Broncos defense, you know, had moments in this game where they stepped up. But the defense didn't come up big when they needed them to in this game. And how did that impact the outcome overall? What can we attribute it to? That's something we're going to dive into on today's episode, Lockdown Broncos. This episode is brought to you by Total Wine and More. In this holiday season, find what you love at Total Wine and More with so many great bottles to choose from. It's easy to find a new favorite Cabernet or Chardonnay or the perfect gifts for everyone on your list with some help from a friendly guide and all with the confidence of knowing you found something special for the lowest price. Love what you find only at Total Wine and More. Curbside pickup and delivery available in most areas. Visit TotalWine.com to learn more. Drink responsibly and be 21. And our good friends over there at Tur Turo, and Turo is the world's largest car sharing marketplace. With Turo, you can book any car that you want, wherever you want it, from a community of local hosts. Browse a huge selection of vehicles for just about any occasion or budget across the U.S., U.K., Canada, and coming soon to Australia. Book a spacious SUV or minivan for a family road trip, or get a classic or luxury car for a special event, birthday, or holiday. Or you can find affordable economy cards if you're on a budget and just need to get from A to to B. Test drive that new electric vehicle you've had your eye on to see how it fits in your everyday life. Many Turo hosts can even deliver the car right to you. Every trip is backed by liability insurance, term conditions, and exclusions apply. Forget boring rental cars and find your drive at Turo.com. Continuing on today's episode, Lockdown Broncos. Just want to say thank you so much to everybody in Broncos country for tuning in and making Lockdown Broncos your first listen of the day every single day on your favorite audio podcasting platform or whether you watch on YouTube. Thank you so much, Broncos country, for bearing with us during this disappointing season as it pertains to the Denver Broncos. But we'll have you covered every single day all year long through the ups and the downs you get both of us here we appreciate you interacting continuing on with today's conversation here on the lockdown broncos post game report the defense in a matchup against the las vegas raiders 
they had moments in this game, Sarah, where they buckled down, they made a couple of big plays, and then they just had some absolute back-breaking plays throughout the entirety of this game in different pieces. First quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter. There's always like one big play. And one of the biggest things that we talked about coming into this matchup, you have to find a way to slow down Josh Jacobs. And he was averaging 5.3 yards per carry. After the first quarter, he had eight eight run, uh, run plays for 42 yards and seemingly was just gashing the Broncos' defense, especially coming off performance where Denver had Derrick Henry to 53 yards rushing. However, the game plan was a lot different because the Broncos' defense there, there's no way they could have played against a, a guy like Josh Jacobs the way that they did in game plan for Derrick Henry because it compromises them in the secondary in the passing game because the Raiders, they're a better passing football team than the Tennessee Titans are. And we saw that in this game. They could not stop Josh Jacobs once again. The story, Josh Jacobs, the Broncos kryptonite, 109 yards on the ground, 54 rushing yards, though a bulk of that came on one of the final plays in overtime that really put the Broncos, oh, not overtime, in the fourth quarter that put the Broncos in a really, really bad position there. This was just a disappointing game from the Broncos' defense. And the way that it ended kind of put the nail in the coffin as to like how this season is overall with just seven games remaining here for this Broncos team. Yeah, it kind of feels like a little bit when the offense finally gets something going that the defense has a bit of a breakdown. And that's not to say that the defense, you know, you can't really say that they've necessarily carried the team this year because what is the team? They're three and seven. But the defense has obviously done the heavy lifting in terms of if the Broncos were to be winning games right now, they would be winning some ugly offensive battles. And certainly the defense would deserve a lot of credit for that. But at the same time, you can go back to a number of different examples, namely the most recent two games where the Broncos have gotten out to 10 to nothing leads. And then all of a sudden the defense has given up some big backbreaking plays to the opposing team and the offense just can't seem to overcome it. Not saying that the defense has to go out there and, and only give up maybe, you know, 10 to 13 points a game. But at the same time, you go up, you know, seven to nothing, 10 to nothing. Then all of a sudden you give up a pretty bad looking drive to touchdown drive to the Raiders here. Again, the Broncos defense isn't immune to giving up touchdowns. They've, you know, they were allowing what 16 points a game this year or something like that. But at the same time, when your defense has been playing so well on the whole this season, you kind of expect, okay, the offense is doing a little bit of the giving. Now the defense has to, he has to kind of respond accordingly. Maybe when you go up 10 to nothing, instead of, Maybe I don't know what they're doing out there differently when they go up 10 to nothing, but it's it certainly seemed like it was easy for the Raiders to move the ball down the field. If there's something different that they got to do, apply more pressure, maybe play it like you're down by three points instead of up by 10. I don't necessarily know like the the mental aspect of it or what, but it does feel kind of like, especially these last two games against the Titans and against the Raiders, the Broncos have had some decent offensive starts. And then, or, you know, the, the defense kind of lets these other teams creep back into the game. So Josh Jacobs, the kryptonite, we get it. Devontae Adams, he had a huge game for the Raiders. But it was once again just like Derek Carr. Every time the Broncos play Derek Carr, Cody, I feel like, man, like that guy must he, – he's like a top 10 QB in the league. He was making some ridiculous plays late in the fourth quarter and in overtime of this game. Just the Broncos couldn't overcome it, man. It's tough to watch. It, the defense, it, it, it's just never together. The offense and the defense, they haven't been together. That was the same true for Vic Fangio era, now here in the Nathaniel Hackett era. I mean, it's just a continuation of things as well, right? And, and I think all week long we're going to see some wild comments about the defense. We're going to see some wild hot takes about Patrick Sertan. I do want to pinpoint the people, right? Because, you know, you see Devontae Adams catch these touchdowns. They're like, oh, my gosh, Patrick Sertan just got beat. On that first one that he had in that in that second quarter of play, first quarter of play, he's playing outside leverage, and he's playing underneath, which means that he's playing zone. He's playing trail technique, which means he's expecting safety help over the top. I saw a lot of massive overreactions about that one. Maybe he couldn't have you know, given up a little bit more depth on there, but outside of that, I don't know why people are blaming Sertan for that one. 
the one in overtime, I mean, that's that's another one of those concepts where the Broncos, they're trying to play everything, keep everything in front of them, but their concepts, especially how, how the Raiders attacked, I mean, they were moving Devontae Adams. There were times he was on the outside. There were times he was lined up as the number two guy, and then they would move him to be the number three guy, which had him attack vertically, or attack the corner, and attack the deep overs. He did just that, so not all that is on Patrick Sertan. Sertan had a couple of moments in this game where you definitely want it back, but I think that you're going to see a lot of crazy overreaction hot takes about Sertan. Tan. Go back and watch the film, folks. Go back and watch it. I'll obviously have some stuff out this week as well as we take a look back at it. But really the biggest issue in the secondary, sir, miscommunication. It seemed like there were several coverage breakdowns overall, and they came at the absolute worst times, especially in the fourth quarter. I mean, Josh Jacobs had a 48, 40, 41 to 48 yard reception on a wheel route with Josie Jewell in coverage that nearly won them the game. I mean, at that point, we're like, oh my gosh, wow, like this is this is what's happened. Like Denver literally, they had the lead, and all they had to do was get a stop. And they allowed a couple of big chunk plays to the Raiders in for in the fourth quarter that led them down the field. And luckily the defense held up in the red zone. They kicked the field goal. They tied up at 16. They go to overtime. And then Denver doesn't even get a chance. And it was just big play after big play after big play. A lot of breakdowns in coverage, there, And ultimately that was what kind of drove the nail in the coffin of the Broncos in this one. I will say this. I after that play in overtime, obviously, you know, the Raiders are celebrating. It's one of the worst feelings as a defensive guy. I've been on the receiving end of something like that before, but I was just looking at the defense. Players were just, I've never seen the Broncos defense as dejected as I did the moment Devontae Adams caught that wide open for the game-winning score. And it was a quiet locker room. I, Like I said, I've seen moments where the locker room was quiet this year, Los Angeles being one of them. But I've never seen a locker room clear out as fast as it did here today. And look, this is a disappointing loss. I mean, the Raiders coming into this matchup were a laughing stock of the NFL. They were one of the worst teams. Now that Denver loses to them, they get swept. They get, you know, lose six consecutive straight games against them. And all of a sudden, now everyone's eyes are on Denver despite the changes. So what does this mean for them going forward? I mean, that is a huge question as we look at the future of this team. The season from a from a playoff standpoint, any playoff aspirations, Broncos country, it's over. That's not going to happen. That's not in the books for the team this year. So as we talked about in the crossover episode with your boy Q, now it becomes evaluation season for the Broncos, for players and things going forward. We'll have all the breakdown here on the Locked On Broncos podcast. And Broncos coach, one of the things we're going to type about as well, you know, with fans are very passionate about this football team. Had a chance to speak with several fans on the way out of the stadium, a lot of disappointment, but also fans who are still saying, you know what, we haven't seen anything like this, but we've been able to see, and this is from a fan, we've been able to see three Super Bowls for this team. Not many teams get a chance to say that. Granted, the last seven to eight years have not been good for this Broncos team. We'll share some reaction for Broncos fans on Twitter coming up here in just a moment. This episode of today's postgame report is brought to you by Prize Picks. And Prize Picks is daily fantasy sports that's done right. And with the Prize Picks app, you choose two to five players that you're focused on heading into the week. And these players will have a projection that's set by Price Picks, and you simply choose whether or not they will have more or less than their Price Picks projection, which could allow you to win 10 times your money on any entry. There's no competing against other people. It's just you versus the projections available. So download the Price Picks app or go to PricePicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code locked on. If you deposit $100, Price Picks will give you $100. If you deposit $50, Price picks will give you fifty dollars. Don't forget to enter promo code locked on at sign up for an instant deposit match up to one hundred dollars. As we dive into the fourth quarter action on today's episode of Locked On Broncos, we're going to share the reaction from Broncos country. Got some really good ones, obviously on Twitter. Fans sent things in. You can get involved in Fan Friday, where we'll put out a tweet on Thursdays. You can tweet your thoughts, your questions. We'll answer them here on the show. But we get some Broncos country reaction, some instant reaction, fresh out of the gates here from a disappointing 2020, 22 to 16 loss here by this Denver team, Sarah. And I coming here from at Dr. Bronco fan 16, he tweeted his response to the tweet says lots of talk about the DC becoming the head coach, but I hear nothing said about him and the results in overtime. I, I think this is a very interesting angle. And he also followed up by saying, I'm not angry. This is just something I'm curious to hear your opinion about in the NFL. I, I think often at times when we look at how good the Broncos defense has been playing, I think we can we all at times expect perfection, right? Azuro Evro, I think is a very 
you know, he's a rising up and coming coach, right? He's the the optics are he's going to be one, a head coach in the next one to three years for some NFL team, whether it be the Broncos, whether it be for somebody else. I I don't necessarily believe we can look at the results of overtime, right? And a couple of the big plays given up and say, okay, well this guy's not cut out to be a head coach. When simply I think that that's just kind of a momentary thing in the moment. The Broncos lost. The defense didn't look great. But I also think that we have to look at the bigger picture. I see the forest through the trees, a common phrase that you use here on this podcast. And and the thing with Ejiro Evero, he's a great leader, fantastic leader, great at making adjustments. There's things that he can do as a defensive coordinator. He's still learning. He's a first-year defensive coordinator. But I also think that there's this adjustment period as well. Because when something happens on the field, we see the negative result. We automatically say, oh, blame it all on the coaching, right? I don't think we can do that here with Ejiro Ever. I still think he's going to be a, a very great head coaching candidate, but I also think that you know we can't let the results and the outcome change our perception on a guy like Evero, who's been a bright spot, who players love, has been a great leader, has been transformational. I'm eager for your thoughts on this one here. Yeah, I think when you look back at this season, Cody, we'll consider the job that Ejiro Evero has done as one of the top two or three best things of the entire team overall. I mean, he inherited Vic Fangio's defense, which is big shoes to fill because, you know, although it didn't work out with Vic Fangio as the team's head coach, Vic Fangio is and was one of the best defensive coordinators in the NFL, even when he was still calling plays as a head coach with the Denver Broncos. Zero Evero inherited that defense, and it's been the number one scoring defense through the majority of this season. I don't know where they're going to stand after giving up 22 points to the Raiders, but they were number one in the NFL in scoring defense going into this game. He's done such a tremendous job, like you said, making adjustments, scheming for defenses. Look, the Broncos have played you know, Justin Herbert as well as anybody this year. They've played a number of other QBs this season that I think you, you can really look at those performances by the defense and say, man, they, they really schemed things really well. The performance that you already mentioned against Derrick Henry, shutting him down after he looked like he couldn't be stopped against Kansas City. Ezero Evero has done a tremendous job this season, and that's why he's being considered such an up-and-coming coach in this league. It's one of the reasons why I think, man, no matter what happens at the end of the season, the Broncos have to find a way to keep him around at least for another year. He's got a good thing going there, and they're building something special on that side of the ball. I think some continuity, some more time for those guys to gel in his system. He's going to be really great, and he's going to make himself one of the top head coaching candidates, probably not for 2023, Cody, unless he goes out and blows somebody away in an interview but we're seeing kind of a a similar path to a guy like D'Amico Ryans who took over for a great defensive coordinator and Robert Sala there in San Francisco. D'Amico Ryans took over that job. That defense has continued to play well and even got a little better. Now you're seeing a similar type of deal with the Denver Broncos defense. Ezero Evero has taken personnel that wasn't even necessarily built for him, and he's gone in there, and he's done something absolutely tremendous. So if anybody in Denver has done their job exceptionally well at the highest level, at an elite level this season, I would have to say it's Ezero Evero. And as disappointing as the end result may be, he has been fantastic. He's been consistent all year long. This is the NFL. Things like this are going to happen. And I'll be very curious to see how the Broncos defense responds this upcoming week against the Carolina Panthers. Our final one here on today's Lockdown Broncos postgame report comes in from at new type underscore JK47. I think he speaks for everybody in Broncos country when he says this. He, he wrote to us, the team did a lot of things right today and still found a way to lose. It is beyond frustrating as hell to see this team not win games. It should be winning. Not only that, this team just has no room for error. And I mean, Sarah, you mentioned, I mean, even with the 10 nothing lead, it doesn't feel like that's good enough for the Broncos, right? Because little things happen. Guys creep back in. And I, I think he's spot on here. The room for error is very minimal. I mean, we talk about the fumble. That really set the Broncos back. Even though they didn't lose possession, the fumble cost the Broncos three points. That probably could have been very valuable in the fourth quarter against this Las Vegas Raiders team that now ties the Broncos at 3-7 and seven on the year. Disappointing all around. And unfortunately, just from a, from a production standpoint, from a win-loss standpoint, the Broncos aren't a good football team this year. They have elements to their process and to their team that are good. And the defense often at times has been the best part of it. They weren't good enough in Sunday's loss against the Las Vegas Raiders. 
Where do the Broncos go from here? Are there any changes in the forecast? Make sure you stay tuned every single day, all week long here this week, Lockdown Broncos. We have you covered with everything in Del Valley. It's Thanksgiving week, which means that we will have a crossover episode that drops on Thursday. But we want you to have a great time with your family. We'll have you covered tomorrow. We'll have you covered on Wednesday. We'll have you covered on Friday as well with our final game preview plus the post-game report after the game in Carolina against the Panthers where I will be on the road covering that game as well. You get all that coverage here, Lockdown Broncos, and much more. Make sure you check out my written work, milehighsports.com. Check out Sarah's written work, predominantlyorange.com. Broncos country. Comment off in the comment section down below. Let us know how you feel about this disappointing loss on Sunday to the Las Vegas Raiders.